and I just knew, I knew it was going to be Tommy Aldridge. So take it all, take take it all full circle. Um, So like I said earlier on, we're going to have another episode coming up in in about a month's time, and we'll we'll do a much deeper dive into into some of the the bands of the time and just our experiences. I'm already fascinated about one thing that that you said, and I'll love to explore, which is uh, you mentioned, you know, Don, and uh, you said he's been into Allman Brothers. Is that what you said? Oh, yeah. He's into the Southern Rock thing, the government mule, the Allman Brothers. Uh, He's, you know, Don is... He just like fine wine, man. I'm telling you, he he's better than ever. His playing is so melodic, and you know, you know, played with a million guitar players. But I got to tell you, you know, Don, there's something about him that just, oh my god, it sets him apart from everybody. And you'll see, you'll you definitely see. I mean, you know, because he'll pull out the slide, and you know, just just some things about his playing that just make you just like. I'll give you an example. We do uh, "Tie Your Mother Down." Yeah, oh, that's a and good he song. does um, he does the George Lynch solo in it, and it's you know, you know the other the the, the main five minutes of the song is there, and it ain't on the band, right? Know, the regular Queen part, but then he rips it all of a sudden into this George Lynch, you know, solo that's just like I don't know. I can't. I won't even pretend I'm doing it. But, <laughs> It's just so you just, all know, Justin's fingers are going all over the imaginary fretboard. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I won't even pretend to try it, but you know, it he, he does, and it's you know, it, it it makes you turn your head and say, "What?" You know, it's, and I think that's that's Don's. Uh, that's just the way he plays. He's just he's so he's so cerebral with his with his with his, with music. You know, he knows the theory. He knows the the, the, the the keys. He's so cerebral that, you know, he can switch at a dime's notice. He could switch at any given. Um, and, and government mule is like that, where, you know, they could be playing war pigs at one minute and they could be what is hip the next. And Don's like that, where he could just totally flip. Another example is boys and uh, we, we play uh, boys are back in town. Yeah. And, you know. You know, for me, it's just a straight triplet groove. For the bass player, it's a triplet groove. But for Don, when he's playing his triplet, excuse me, he's, you know, he's thinking of it as jazz chords. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's so melodically in tune that, you know, you know, he just, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall, you know, and just hear how he practices at home. I don't know how he does that. You know, he comes here, he knows the parts left and right, but he's so, he's got it. He's got it. You know, so the the reason that I, I brought that that back up because I'll I'll be interested to you know just how you get from uh, so here's a little you know uh, inside baseball is that the very technical stuff when we were first playing the stuff that he was interested in um, like Ingve right yeah. very very technical very classical and you know you would never think of uh, even though now I will say um, Ingve Malmstein has has I don't want to say loosened up, but um, he plays with a lot more feel than he did, I think, back then. Um, where, whereas, you know, I don't automatically think of an Ingve style player playing a blues or southern or or boogie rock kind of stuff, because these are like completely right. opposite poles, you know. Um, but that's where the you know the evolution of the things that were popular even when we were younger and in, in the era that we're talking about, because. It was almost like they had gotten away from like the the um, uh, blues based stuff, but honestly, and, and again, we'll start another like four hours if we go down this road. Um, <laughs> is is when you got to the point where, uh, and and you and I talked a little bit about this uh, a couple weeks ago. This kind of um, bisection of, of music where uh, the grunge thing, right? But bands like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, those kind of bands, uh, even Pearl Jam, very bluesy, very blues based, yeah. right? But then you also had this other branch where, like the the prog and prog metal were, were kind of branching off too at the same time. Um, so if you were a player who was interested in both, you really got exposed to a lot of really different type uh, of uh, a feel of groove. And if you have theory, you can take the little bits here and there. I, I mean, I think someone like Steve Vai is a way better bluesy player now than he was even when he was in White Snake. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. And- you know, you just mentioned the prog rock, you know, I, there's a rabbit hole that we can go on for another 10 <laughs> hours. But, 
Queensryche, Dream Theater, second record. Um, I think where we were when we were kids and where we are now, and I mean, you had to go full circle. And now let's say Dream Theater, for example, you know, you had Winger prior to that. You had White Snake prior to that. So it's almost like it was like the next step for us to learn. It was, you know, Pull Me Under was a, from Dream Theater was a, a complicated song in the sense that it was more complicated than Winger. But, you know, it wasn't Zappa yet. I couldn't, I, I'm thinking when I was 13 years old, I couldn't handle Zappa, but I could, Dream Theater was more digestible. I mean, you know, it was, you know, very, you know, straight four, four, you know, a couple little tricks with the feet, a couple little, you know, crazy. And then every, there's then the big fill and pull me under that, you know, had the whole world, you know, trying to figure out for, for a couple of years. But my point is, is that, you know, I think God gives you what you can handle at that moment. And I think for, for us, it was, you know, I, I started off with my Hall and Oates and then I progressed to, you know, and I progressed to kind of like the beginning of kind of like a kiss, let's say. And then, you know, maybe add Doc into the mix, you know, oh, Mick Brown did this cool little fill. And then you just work your way up. And then, then you get to a point where, you know, do I want to go that next level to, you know, some, you know, um, you know, some really crazy Zappa tune or, or I'm kind of content right here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of, we're going back to Don too. I think Don's, Don hit that, that plateau where, you know, he's so cerebral, he's got it all. Now, how do I assimilate it to what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does. It does. Yeah. You know, that, that's the whole thing. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, Queen Strike as, as an example. So that was one of those bands that I'm like, okay, um, if I'm going to sing, then then Jeff Tate is like a blueprint, right, <laughs> of someone who is so technically skilled and accurate and can move between the different voices uh, just so easily, um, but very formal. And I try to do that, like that formal thing, but then that becomes constraining, Right. Yeah. So then, you know, there's someone like Mike Patton, who on that that uh, Angel Dust record is doing things that no one was doing before as as a singer, well, not like before, but certainly taking all these things and, and, and mixing it up. So it's just like anything else. It's like you take these little bit of pieces. The hard part, I think, particularly when you want to do your own music or do your own creation is finding the the unique voice in all of this. I mean, and yeah. that's really, I think, the most difficult thing because, you know, when you're doing a, a cover song, you have a clear blueprint. Now, you have some leeway. You can do some things. You can make it your own. But really, truly finding your your own voice, your own style, I think is the most difficult thing. So, I mean, I just encourage, you know, any, any young people out there, and, and certainly mistake that I made was, A, I didn't put in the work. And it's work no matter what it is, even if it's something yeah. that you love and enjoy – um, if it's your voice, that's your instrument. You practice it, you build it. If it's drums, you practice it, guitar, all those things. Um, but also be cognizant that even if you're doing a cover song, that it's in your voice. Now, I always liked to emulate the singers because I found that challenging. I found that interesting. Hey, can I contort my voice to sound like X, Y, and Z? And And we all do that when we're learning, but you really have to find what makes you unique. Um Right. And it's not only technique, it's also, let's say, the sound of, of, of your guitar. The sound, um, I think you, you were saying, I forget what band we were talking about earlier, but the sound of his guitar, uh, who was it? It wasn't The Edge. Who, who were we talking about when you were Phil saying? Phil Collin. Oh, yeah, Phil Collin. That's yeah. a great example. You know, technically, uh, you know, I'm sure he is great, but you don't really see that on the records with his tone. You know, so it's it's not just about, you know, how many hours you're in the woodshed, you know, practice and practice and practice. And it's, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, Johnny Robb, he's this drummer guy, but he does a lot of the drum and bass and kind of uh, kind of um, kind of the dubstep kind of stuff. He's He's got some tricks under his sleeves. I mean, he's a great drummer, period. But he does like little tricks where he'll take cymbals and put it on the drum. So he creates this kind of like white noise stuff. You know, and, and things like that. He's not known technically, but he's known as a, you know, his sound is so avant-garde, I guess you can say. Um, the dude from Wilco. Remember Wilco? Oh, gosh, yeah. Jeff Tweedy, but who's the drummer? Um, I, I, 
if you say his name, I'll remember it. But he's another one. He used to have this um, long, um, a long, like a straw, and it would go into his drum, and he would blow air into his drum, and he would hit the drum, and you would hear it change the tone. Really? Yeah. Uh, that is uh, Glenn Koch? But yes, Glenn Koch. Yes. So that's kind of like uh, you know, oh gosh, what is it called? Uh, the the Frampton and the Richie Sambora thing. Uh, the the um, the vocoder. Oh, the there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like that for drums. Yeah, well, that's what this guy does. What a Check, weird thing. Go on YouTube. Check him out. I mean, he's he's nuts. I mean, that, but that's what I'm saying. No one will ever. You you won't be reading about him in a magazine because he did you know the, this incredible fill around the drum. You know, you're going to read about him because he took that that marker and he and he drew i don't know and he, and he tapped on his symbol with a marker you know he did something a little bit just off yeah but i mean it's it's uh you know i don't want to say it's 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 gimmickry uh, gimmickry but i mean sometimes it is and i mean that's what yeah. most bands are looking for they're sure. they're looking for a, a gimmick they're looking for right. something to break through um you know and and sometimes people have to you know copy gimmicks but I mean, yeah. if it if it sells, I mean, I look at the you know the 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 evolution, right? Of we'll talk about the glam music, right? And yeah, yeah, the New York Dolls. New York Dolls yeah. were were completely different than than Kiss, but Kiss begets you know all these you know other bands, and then you fast forward, and uh, you know I, I mentioned Mike Patton, but you know Mr. Bungle, they're all wearing masks. Well, you right. you just wait five years later, and that's Slipknot's gimmick. You know, and and Slipknot's you know quadruple platinum, and you know right. Mr. Bungle's playing tiny clubs. Right, right. I think that goes back to what we were t- saying about King's X. You know, you know their music is one thing, but you know fashion plays a part in it, and you know just the overall, I guess gimmick. I guess you know it, it becomes commonplace, like we were just saying. Absolutely, and you know yeah. they get the copycats and all that, but you know that's where the music is important, though. Right. So just using the hair bands, there were distinct differences between Poison and Warrant and, and bands that are of the genre. And I know you wouldn't probably consider them a hair band, but they're like Tesla. Right. Yeah. Tesla couldn't be more different, but they were doing a tour with David Lee Roth and Tesla and Bullet Boys and all these bands that would have all the big hair and the makeup and, and the, the clothes and the fashion. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the music was all so different, you know, and that's oh, what, that's how genres become what they are. Um, right. But yeah, it is sometimes just the, the, the gimmick that gives away. I, I just remember uh, I mentioned Eric Singer. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay, this is a weird digression. All right. So <laughs> it's an album that you cannot buy. Yeah. And that is Badlands. Yeah. And uh, that video for Dreams in the Dark, yeah. and he's got the suspended, you know, still, and he's like, ding, 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 right? And it was, it, it seems so schlocky and so sticky, yet when when we were whatever age we were to change, like, that dude's cool, look at him, like, it just, it, you know, it kicks ass. Um, right. And it was like this simple thing, yet the rest of the band, you know, was uh, pretty just straight about it, you know? Yeah. Um, little shout out to Jakey Lee, he's got a solo band, he does some good stuff here and there. Well, if you go back to Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich did it. So I guess if he did it, it's okay to do it. So, but you know, it's the whole thing. I mean, go back, you know, that's just, you know, the, the, the lineage of, of, of music. I mean, every, every guitar, drum, whatever instrument you play, I'm sure there's someone back there doing some kind of gimmicky thing. Um, you know, especially if you think about like, let's say Buddy Rich, who was all technique, you know, for him to have fun on that band stage, you know, he would hit the symbol from underneath. I mean, Eric Singer stole it right from him, and that's okay. Well, yeah, and then, you know, you mentioned, you know, Ringo earlier. So, I mean, Keith Moon needed to separate himself from, you know, just being the guy that's that's sitting behind the kid. So, I mean, you think about uh, um, Charlie Watt, straight, yeah. you know, perfect posture, right. you know, very, very classic style, right? right? Classic uh, uh, grip. And then you have Ringo, you know, again, did some, uh, you know, occasionally innovative stuff. And you mentioned, right. uh, I remember years ago, we were talking about him doing loops and those kind of things in the studio. Yep. Um, Keith Moon needed to be this madman. But like, I mean, he was more in the vein of like a, a, a Buddy Rich, right? Yeah. As, as far as his playing style. Oh, gosh. Oh, um, what is his name? It's going to, it's going to, kill me until i remember uh the drummer for um 
uh, cream. 